Section 19 of A Visit to the Holy Land. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 10 of A Visit to the Holy Land, Egypt and Italy, Part 1, by Ida L. Pfeiffer. It was only nine o'clock when we reached Nazareth, and repaired to the house for strangers in the Franciscan convent, where the priests welcomed us very kindly. As soon as we had made a short survey of our rooms, which resulted in finding them very like those at Jerusalem, both as regards appearance and arrangement, we set forth once more to visit all the remarkable places, and above all the church which contains the Grotto of Annunciation. This church, to which we were accompanied by a clergyman, was built by St. Helena, and is of no great size. In the background a staircase leads down into the grotto, where it is asserted that the Virgin Mary received the Lord's message from the angel. Three little pillars of granite are still to be seen in this grotto. The lower part of one of these pillars was broken away by the Turks, so that it is only fastened from above. On the strength of this circumstance many have revered that the pillar hangs suspended in air. Had these men but looked beyond their noses, had they only cast their eyes upwards, they could not have had the face to preach such a miracle where it is so palpable that none exists. A picture on the wall, not badly executed, represents the Annunciation. The house of the Virgin is not shown here, because, according to the legend, an angel carried it away to Loreto in Italy. A few steps lead to another grotto, affirmed to be the residence of a neighbor of the Virgin, during whose absence she presided over the house and attended to the duties of the absent Mary. Another grotto in the town is shown as the workshop of Joseph. It has been left in its primitive state, except that a plain wooden altar has been added. Not far off we find the synagogue where our Lord taught the people, thereby exasperating the Pharisees to such a degree that they wished to cast him down from a rock outside the city. In conclusion, we were shown an immense block of stone on which the Savior is said to have eaten the Passover with his disciples. In the afternoon, we went to see Mary's well on the road to Tabirath, at a short distance from Nazareth. This well is fenced round with masonry and affords pure, clear water. Hither, it is said, the Virgin came every day to draw water, and here the women and girls of Nazareth, may still be daily seen walking to and fro with pitchers on their shoulders. Those whom we saw were all poorly clad, and looked dirty. Many wore no covering on their head, and, what was far worse, their hair hung down in a most untidy manner. Their bright eyes were the only handsome feature these people possessed. The custom of wearing silver coins round the head also prevailed here. Today was a day of misfortune for me, on the morning, when we departed from Legon, I had already felt unwell. On the road I was seized with violent headache, nausea, and feverish shiverings, so that I hardly thought I should be able to reach Nazareth. The worst of all this was that I felt obliged to hide my illness, as I had done on our journey to Jerusalem, for fear I should be left behind. The wish to view all the holy places in Nazareth was also so powerful within me that I made a great effort and accompanied the rest of my party for the whole day, though I was obliged every moment to retire into the background that my condition might not be observed. But when we went to table, the smell of the viands produced such an effect upon me that I hastily held my handkerchief before my face as though my nose were bleeding, and hurried out. Thanks to my sunburnt skin, through which no paleness could penetrate, no one noticed that I was ill. The whole day long I could eat nothing, but towards evening I recovered a little. My appetite now also returned, but unfortunately nothing was to be had but some bad mutton broth and an omelet made with rancid oil. It is bad enough to be obliged to subsist on such fare when we are in health, but the hardship increases tenfold when we are ill. However, I sent for some bread and wine, and strengthened myself therewith as best I might. June 15th Thanks be to heaven, I was to-day once more pretty well. In the morning I could already mount my horse and take part in the excursion we desired to make to Tabarinth. Passing Mary's well and a mountain crowned by some ruins, the remains of ancient Canaan, we ride for about three miles towards the foot of Mount Tabor, the highest summit of which we do not reach for more than an hour. There were no signs of a beaten road, 
and we were obliged to ride over all obstacles, a course of proceeding which so tired our horses that in half an hour's time they were quite knocked up, so that we had to proceed on foot. After much toil and hardship, with a great deal of climbing and much suffering from the heat, we gained the summit, and were repaid for the toil of the ascent, not only by the reflection that we stood on classic ground, but also by the beautiful view which lay spread before our eyes. This prospect is indeed magnificent. We overlook the entire plain of Safed, as far as the shores of the Galilean Sea. Mount Tabor is also known by the name of the Mountain of Bliss. Here it was that our Lord preached his exquisite sermon on the mount. Of all the hills I have seen in Syria, Mount Tabor is the only one covered to the summit with oaks and carob trees. The valleys, too, are filled with the richest earth, instead of barren sand. But in spite of all this, the population is thin, and the few villages are wretched and puny. The poor inhabitants of Syria are woefully ground down. The taxes are too high in proportion to the productions of the soil, so that the peasants cannot possibly grow more produce than they require for their own consumption. Thus, for instance, orchards are not taxed in the aggregate, but according to each separate tree. For every olive tree the owner must pay a piastra, or a piastra and a half and the same sum for an orange or lemon tree. And heavily taxed as he is, the poor peasant is never safe in saying, Such and such a thing belongs to me. The pasha may shift him to another piece of land, or drive him away altogether, if he thinks it advisable to do so, for a pasha's power in his province is as great as that of the sultan himself in Constantinople. Porcupines are to be met with on Mount Tabor. We found several of their fine, horny quills. From the farther side of the mountain we descended into the beautiful and spacious valley of Safed, the scene of the miracle of the loaves and fishes, and rode on for some hours until we reached Tabarith. A very striking scene opens before the eyes of the traveler on the last mountain before Tabarith. A lovely landscape lies suddenly unrolled before him. The valley sinks deeply down to the Galilean Sea round the shores of which a glorious chain of mountains rises in varied and picturesque terrace like forms. More beautiful than all the rest towers in snowy grandeur the mighty chain of the Anti-Lebanon, its white surface glittering in the rays of the sun, and distinctly mirrored in the clear bosom of the lake. Deep down lies the little town of Tabarinth, shadowed by palm trees and guarded by a castle raised a little above it. The unexpected beauty of this scene surprised us so much that we alighted from our horses and passed more than half an hour on the summit of the mountain to gaze at our leisure upon the wondrous picture. Count S. drew a hurried but very successful sketch of the landscape which we all admired so much, though its mountains were naked and bare. But such is the peculiar character of eastern scenery. In Europe, Meadows, Alps, and woods exhibit quite a distinct class of natural beauty. In a mountain range of Europe, a sight like the one we were now admiring would scarcely have charmed us so much. But in these regions, poor alike in inhabitants and in scenery, the traveler is contented with little, and little thing charms him. For instance, would not a plain piece of beef have been a greater luxury to us on our journey than the most costly delicacies at home? Thus we felt also with regard to scenery. On entering the town we experienced a feeling of painful emotion. Tabarith lay still half in ruins, for the dreadful earthquake of 1839 had made this place one of the chief victims of its fury. How must the town have looked immediately after the calamity, when even now, in spite of the extensive repairs, it appears almost like a heap of ruins? We saw some houses that had completely fallen in, others were very much damaged, with large cracks in the walls, and shattered terraces and towers. Everywhere, in short, we wandered among ruins. Above four thousand persons, more than half of the entire population, are said to have perished in this earthquake. We alighted at the house of a Jewish doctor, who entertains strangers, as there is no inn at Tabarith. I was quite surprised to find everything so clean and neat in this man's house. The little rooms were simply but comfortably furnished, the small courtyard was flagged with large stones, and round the walls of the hall were ranged narrow benches with soft cushions. We were greatly astonished at this appearance of neatness and order, 
but our wonder rose when we made the discovery that the Jews, who are very numerous at Tabarinth, are not clothed in the Turkish or Greek fashion, but quite like their brethren in Poland and Galicia. Most of them also spoke German. I immediately inquired the reason of this peculiarity, and was informed that all the Jewish families resident in this town originally came from Poland or Russia, with the intention of dying in the promised land. As a rule, all Jews seem to cherish a warm desire to pass their last days in the country of their forefathers, and to be buried there. We requested of our young hostess, whose husband was absent, to prepare us without delay a good quantity of pilau and fowls, adding that we would in the meantime look at the town and the neighboring baths at the Sea of Gennesareth, but that we should return in an hour and a half at the most. We then proceeded to the Sea of Gennesareth, which is a freshwater lake. We entered a fisherman's boat, in order that we might sail on the waters where our Lord had once bid the winds be still. We were rowed to the warm springs, which rise near the shore, a few hundred paces from the town. On the lake all was calm, but no sooner had we landed than a storm arose, between the fishermen and ourselves. In this country, if strangers neglect to bargain beforehand for every stage with guides, porters, and people of this description, they are nearly sure of being charged an exorbitant sum in the end. This happened to us on our present little trip, which certainly did not occupy more than half an hour. We took our seats in the boat without arranging for the fares, and on disembarking offered the fishermen a very handsome reward. But these worthies threw down the money, and demanded thirty piastres, whereas, if we had bargained with them at first, they would certainly not have asked ten. We gave them fifteen piastres to get rid of them, but this did not satisfy their greediness. On the contrary, they yelled and shouted until the Count's servants threatened to restore peace and quietness with their sticks. At length the fishermen were so far brought to their senses that they walked away, scolding and muttering as they went. Adjoining the warm springs we found a bathing-house, built in round form and covered with a cupola. Here we also met a considerable number of pilgrims, mostly Greeks and Armenians from the neighborhood who were journeying to Jerusalem. They had encamped beside the bathing-house. Half of these people were in the water, where a most animated conversation was going on. We also wished to enter the building, not for the purpose of bathing, but to view the beauty and arrangements of the interior, which have been the subject of many laudatory descriptions. But at the entrance such a cloud of vapor came rolling towards us that we were unable to penetrate far. I saw enough, however, to feel convinced that in the description of these baths poetry or exaggeration had led many a pen far beyond the bounds of fact. Neither the exterior of this building, nor the cursory glance I was enabled to throw into the interior, excited either my curiosity or my astonishment. Seen from without, these baths resemble a small-sized house, built in a very mediocre style, and with very slender claims to beauty. The interior displayed a large quantity of marble, for instance, in the floor, the sides of the bath, etc., but marble is not such a rarity in this country that it can raise this bathing kiosk into a wonder building or render it worthy of more than a passing glance. I endeavor to see everything exactly as it stands before me and to describe it in my simple diary without addition or ornament. At eight o'clock in the evening we returned tired and hungry to our comfortable quarters, flattering ourselves that we should find the plain supper we had ordered a few hours before smoking on the covered table ready for our arrival. But neither in the hall nor the chamber could we find even a table, much less a covered one. Half dead with exhaustion, we threw ourselves on chairs and benches, looking forward with impatience to the supper and the welcome rest that was to follow it. Messenger after messenger was dispatched to the culinary regions to inquire if the boiled fowls were not yet in an eatable condition. Each time we were promised that supper would be ready in a quarter of an hour, and each time nothing came of it. At length, at ten o'clock, a table was brought into the room, after some time a single chair appeared, and then one more, then came another interval of waiting, until at length a clean tablecloth was laid. These arrivals occupied the time until eleven o'clock, when the master of the house, who had been absent on an excursion, made his appearance, and with him came a puny roast fowl. No miracle, alas, took place at our table like that of the plain of Safed. 
We were but seven persons, and so the fowl need only have been increased seven times to satisfy us all. But, as it was, each person received one rib and no more. Our supper certainly consisted of several courses brought in one after the other. Had we known this, we certainly should have soon arranged the matter, for then each person would have appropriated the whole of a dish to himself. In the space of an hour and a quarter nine or ten little dishes made their appearance, but the portion of food contained in each was so small that our supper may be said to have consisted of a variety of tastes. We would greatly have preferred two good-sized dishes to all these kickshaws. The dishes were a roast, a boiled, and a baked chicken, a little plate of prepared cucumbers, an equally small portion of this vegetable in a raw state, a little pilau, and a few small pieces of mutton. Our host kindly provided food for the mind during supper by describing to us a series of horrible scenes, which had occurred at the time of the earthquake. He, too, had lost his wife and children by this calamity, and only owed his own life to the circumstance that he was absent at a sick bed when the earthquake took place. Half an hour after midnight we at length sought our resting places. The doctor very kindly gave up his three little bedrooms to us, but the heat was so oppressive that we preferred quartering ourselves on the stones in the yard. They made a very hard bed, but we none of us felt symptoms of indigestion after our sumptuous meal. End of section 19